What's up folks, Nate here at Tumble Dino Works. Today we're going to finally do a bit of a deep dive into the data we've collected on our R9 over this past season. Spoke with Mark DeGrasse racing it in the Wimmer and Omer series. And we went ahead and put Andy Debrino on it for a track day out at the Ridge Motorsports Park just to see what it's really capable of doing with a national level racer piloting the bike. Now as we already covered pretty in depth on our social media posts over the last several months, Mark has essentially just clean swept the Wimmer and Omer 750 Superbike class on our R9. They don't let us race this bike locally in the 600 classes for political nonsense reasons I'm not going to get into today, but the reality is that we're, slight, we're racing against 750 Superbikes and we just absolutely walked away with just about every podium position you could possibly have for every race that we entered. I I think he entered 15 races because there's a couple events that he had prior obligations to. I'm pretty sure we got 12 golds, two silvers, and one bronze because of a couple like jump starts and just weird, stupid, well, shit happens racing mistakes. But regardless, Mark did a fantastic job racing this bike for us this past season because at the start of the year, and I told him up front, it was going to be a bit of an uphill battle while we went through all the testing and tuning development we needed to go through to be able to offer our tuning services for sort of each stage of modification that people are going to want to do to these bikes. Because when we first sent them out on the bike, it only had Chuck's V1 cams installed, the DNA Stage 2 intake kit, and a full Acro with our tuning in place. The bike made like 125 horsepower, but that honestly isn't even really competitive with essentially like a super stock ZX6, you know, which we get to make nearly 130 horsepower on pump gas with stock internals all day long. Whereas at the end of the season, he was racing the bike in what I consider like the proper form with the Ram Air kit in place, the super bike head from Chuck Giacchetto, those same V1 cams, the full spark exhaust, everything culminating together with 140 horsepower and 72 pounds of torque, which actually made the bike properly competitive for this class. So the last time we went ahead and raced this bike with Mark, we were out of Pacific Raceways, which was essentially the end of the season here for Wimmera and Omra. And taking a quick look at the data here, there's a couple things I just want to highlight and bring up that people will probably find interesting. Pacific Raceways has a pretty long straight section here. It's actually just full of kinks as you come out of the bus stop, you go through what we call the death chute and then get onto the main drag strip here at the track. And then there's a fucking wall right there that you pretty much rub your right shoulder on as you crest through turn one to go down into the heavy braking zone here at turn two. But what we were curious to see is how fast Mark could actually get this R9 going out there with our tuning in place with that proper engine spec making 140 horsepower. Now remember, Mark's a pretty big dude. He's like 225 pounds without his gear on. So with his gear on, he's, he's a pretty big guy. He's a big muscular man. So he's certainly not a little jockey. And we were still seeing a pretty much flat 153 horsepower as you're going past the wall there in turn one before the braking zone in turn two. It just back to back to back non-stop lap after lap. 153 mile an hour on this thing with perfect fueling, by the way, as we're going down the straightaway. This is hard to replicate on these bikes. I've already covered this in a prior video because yeah, we're seeing exactly where I want to be, right about 13.2 to one AFR with the Ram Air functioning. But obviously these bikes don't have Ram Air from the factory. So it takes a lot of data logging exactly like this to be able to adjust the fueling values as necessary to actually get the bike to perform properly with Ram Air in place. But obviously, once it's all working, it works fantastic. I mean, 153 mile an hour on a super sport bike is amazing here. Uh, this was actually a 127.0 lap time, which at the Ridge on a super sport bike is hauling ass. Now, even before that last round at Pacific Raceways, Mark actually already had the championship locked up with just how well he had done in all the races leading up to the final two races of the season. because We got one on Saturday and one on Sunday with Wimmer and Omra, but that's where we ended the season. However, that's not where we ended our testing. We went ahead and sent Mr. Andy Debrino out on our R9 at the very end of September after the Wimmer and Omer season was over to actually one of Mark's track days at a Too Fast track day at the Ridge Motorsports Park to go ahead and produce this for me and get me some data logs with a proper national level racer riding this bike at a racetrack he is intimately familiar with and actually holds the Super Hooligan track record at in the Moto America series.
as you can see there in that quick clip of a lap of Andy riding the bike at the ridge, he had an absolute blast doing so. And it's very important to remember a couple things here. Uh, Andy really only got, because that track unfortunately had a couple red flags, a pretty gnarly crash, some guy accidentally caught a part of the field on fire out in turn three. He really only got about two clean sessions on the bike. And even with only two clean, two clean sessions out there, excuse me, he managed to go ahead and put down a lap time that would have put him well in the mid-pack at Moto America Supersport on tires he'd never ridden on before. He's never once ridden on the modern World Superbike Pirellis at all. And they feel radically different than the Dunlops he's used to racing in the Moto America series on a bike that he'd never ridden on before at a track day. So all those things put together, for him to still be mid-pack in Moto America Supersport, in those conditions is astounding. A 147.7 was his fastest lap out there. And again, for a cold track day on tires he's not familiar with, on a bike he'd never ridden before, is absolutely hauling ass. And what we wanted to see is the actual data logging of the bike put through those paces so I can honestly just go through and check everything out and make sure it's also working as we intended. Now, obviously, I'm not going to show every single channel that we're logging here in these ECUs because, well, a lot of that's just proprietary and I'm not interested in helping out other tuners. But the important stuff here that I will share with you guys is this. Uh, the bike still worked exactly as expected from a fueling standpoint. We're hanging out in like the 13.1 to 13.2 AFR range pretty much everywhere at wide open throttle while we're going down all the straight sections here. And the fueling throughout the rest of it looked exactly as I wanted to see during some of the deceleration heavy braking zones. The other important thing to note here is that he was actually rather quote-unquote gentle with this thing. Uh, you know, the rev limiter on this bike as I have it set up right now is about 12,250 RPM. And I don't think he ever actually even broke 12,000 RPM the entire time he was riding this thing. He was pretty nice to it. Whereas Mark generally isn't. He has a uh, self-imposed lack of what he calls mechanical sympathy and just absolutely torture tested this thing for us all season long. But after I went ahead and showed Andy this, it, we were all just kind of laughing because he actually left a bit of time on the table here just trying not to ride the rev limiter all the time. And after I told him that he really did have like another 500 RPM to go no matter where I looked at here in these fast laps, he just went, well, sweet. I could have gone even faster. But what I found even more impressive was the top speeds he was able to achieve on our bike out there at the ridge. Because again, we do have the data that Moto America publishes when it comes to just outright trap speeds out there for all the national tracks that they stop at, and the ridge is one of them. So I quickly took a glance at the top speed he did on that fast lap of his, which was 146 miles an hour, and then just pulled up Moto America's essentially timesheets and took a look at the trap speeds they were reporting there, and he would have been the third fastest bike at the Ridge this last year on pump gas. Again, we're not running Moto America's MGPR spec fuel or T4 or anything in this. This is just straight pump gas. And he would have been the third fastest bike out there on the track, which I found both personally pleasing and absolutely hilarious. Because again, this was a cold track day on tires he'd never been on before on a bike he really only had like two sessions of time on. What was also really fun for both myself and actually Mark to go ahead and look back at and compare was essentially Mark's laps here at the Ridge versus Andy's because Mark's best time out there on our bike was a 149.1 while we were going through the development process. In full disclosure, the Ram Air was not properly working here. We, there was some weirdness going on that I'm not really going to get into from a technical standpoint because, well, again, I'll let other tuners make their own mistakes and figure shit out as they go, but... He did a 149.1 out there on our bike, racing with Wimmera and Omra. I believe that was actually with T4 in the tank. And Andy did that 147.7 at that cold track day. But even looking at that, it was just fun for Mark and I to go ahead and look back at where Mark can actually improve himself as a rider. Because now we're talking about essentially the same bike with just a very slight tweak to the Ram Air kit and some tuning here. And you can see that pretty much everywhere, when you're looking at the peaks here with speed, Andy is just sharper. He carries the speed further into each corner, he brakes harder, he actually respects what we call the slow point of the corner more, gets slower so he can drive out harder once he gets direction, and that nets him obviously more speed in pretty much all of the straight line areas at this track. And again, Mark's a big dude, and he's significantly lighter than Mark. I'm guessing somewhere in the range of like at least 60 pounds lighter. But it was still very fun to go ahead and go back to compare all of this because even these little changes here, like where they each get in terms of speed in some of these slower corners and more technical areas of the ridge, 
obviously then let Mark go back and look and go, okay, I can improve in this area, this area, and this area. And we already knew there was some areas that Mark was leaving time out here on the table. Because there's a couple portions of the ridge that you can carry a lot more speed through that are just kind of downright dangerous to do so. One of them is this spot right here. This is going down the hill through turn seven. And this is where you see, if you watch any of the Moto America Super Sport racing in prior seasons, the epic pr crashes from folks like Stefano Mesa, for example. Actually, I think it was in Super Hooligans. When he was on the Energica bike and just wadded himself going down the hill there. Mark knows this. Mark's crashed there. And he definitely pulls out a little bit when he's going over the speed hump there when you go down the hill through seven. But that obviously then creates significant advantage for somebody like Andy, who, well, is a national level and professional racer and just doesn't care and will hang it out there to the tone of like nine mile an hour improvement by actually just running over that portion of the track still on the throttle. So it was interesting to go back and look at this for Mark from just a rider versus rider perspective. But what was also even more interesting for me to look at was just where these guys are using the revs in different portions of the track because obviously there is some huge differences here from how one guy is riding the bike versus another just in terms of what gear they're in and where they're letting this thing rev out to again andy was babying this thing and not letting it get anywhere near the 12,000 rpm mark let alone the 12 250 where there's a couple spots out here like going into turn what is this yeah 13 for example where mark had this thing way out there past the rev limit actually at like 12,500 RPM, just riding the limiter going into turn 13, whereas Andy isn't anywhere even close to that. So again, it was all just very interesting data for us to go ahead and look at and compare as we've gone through this season from one incredibly talented club racer that's actually won Wimmer and Omer series in the past versus having a proper national level rider like Andy piloting our bike. The other thing that I was also very curious to see was what sort of temperatures we could data log on this thing when somebody like Andy was out there on the track producing a lap that would have put him in the mid-pack at Moto America Supersport on pump gas. Because obviously we're pushing these engines dramatically past where they performed stock. Uh, stock, our bike made like 107 horsepower and with that configuration for the engine and the Ram Air kit, exhaust, intake and our tuning in place, it makes 140. So it's a massive improvement over stock, like almost a third more power than it made from the factory. And obviously at a certain point, you start wondering if the thing is going to continue to keep the engine cool with the OEM cooling system in place, and it absolutely does. In fact, at the end of the straightaways, we were only seeing about 84 Celsius, which is hilariously low. I mean, again, if it was under 95 Celsius, I still would have been overjoyed. But seeing that we are still down in the 80s, even when the bike was the most stressed going down the straightaway, it, it's more than I could have ever hoped for. I honestly expected at a certain point we were going to have to upgrade the cooling system in these bikes, but seeing that we're still here in the 80s when you're doing a 147 out there at the ridge, as we continue to go through development here in the off season and push this platform even further and hopefully get into the 150 horsepower range, I really have no concerns about the OEM cooling system being able to handle any of that whatsoever. Now, yes, it was a cold day when Andy was out there. I say cold. It was like in the low 60s, but it's cold when you're trying to put down a fast lap at a track day. But we still also obviously data logged all of that when Mark was racing the bike out there in like July and August when it was just stupidly hot, you know, nearly 100 degree ambient air temperatures and the bike still never saw anywhere near 95 Celsius. So, you know, albeit running 1.7 seconds slower per lap, that is still plenty of room to allow us to continue to expand on the output of the engine without having to worry about the cooling system on these bikes, which was exactly what I was hoping to see. Now, obviously, as I've mentioned in many of our prior videos as well, this level of in-depth data analysis and just honestly torture testing when we go through all of our tuning R&D with professional riders like folks like Andy or club racers like our friend Mark DeGrasse is really what sets us apart from pretty much every other tuner out there on the planet offering tuning for these bikes. Because again, we're accomplishing all of this with the OEM electronics, whereas on the Moto America Supersport teams and at World Supersport, they're required to use the Mectronic ECUs, which are ridiculously overpriced in my personal opinion, because they are required to be subjected to the next-gen Supersport compliant class balancing. We're going ahead and doing all of this development purely on the stock ECU and going through all of this testing and tuning and data logging because we want to be able to provide you guys with the best tuning solution possible as you go ahead and build your own R9. Because if you can do everything the bike is capable of doing on the OEM electronics, why in the world would you want to spend $8,000 on a Mectronic ECU, the kit dash, and harness, and everything else that goes along with it? 
So that is where we've ended the majority of our testing and tuning development for 2025 on the R9 that I'm probably gonna be able to share with you guys right away. We do have our bike sitting back there behind me actually, completely torn apart, engine apart. I already went through and showed you guys just how well all the internals held up in a very short video I posted about a month ago. But we will be going through a lot of testing and tuning development for additional pistons, cams, and other internal engine components with some of the factory back teams here in the off season. Once we go ahead and start diving into that, I'm guessing sometime in, it might be 25, late December, early January, I'll obviously share a lot of that with you guys. Because my ultimate goal is to be able to get this platform up into the 150 horsepower range safely on pump gas with our custom ECU mapping in place. And then next season we're racing it again with Wimmer and Omra. And eh, maybe I'll just have Andy do it this year. We'll see what he's doing next year. I already actually know what he's doing next year. I just can't talk about it yet. My goal is that he'll be able to hop back on this bike as we continue to go ahead and push the engine development further and further next season and just see what he can actually accomplish on this bike because, well, let's face it, he's really fucking fast, especially out there at the Ridge Motorsports Park. And I would be very, very happy to see this bike get down into like the 44s out there just for my own personal enjoyment. Now, obviously, just looking at stuff like data logs is not very exciting for most people. So every time I do one of these deep dives, I always wonder, really, if people honestly watch this stuff and take anything away from it. Because I also have to dumb a lot of it down into layman's terms. Let's face it, most people are not looking at data logging in anywhere near this type of configuration, which is actually relatively limited in comparison to what I could be showing you guys as far as all the data streams that we log when we have these bikes on track. So if you do like seeing this type of more just in-depth, nitty-gritty, what I'll call nerdy content leave us a like or a comment or something like that because doing this type of stuff really does take actually quite a bit of time out of my already very, very busy day and certainly never gets nearly as many views as just watching dyno runs in our dyno room of all the bikes we go through all of our intake and exhaust specific testing and tuning for. And for those of you looking to go ahead and convert your own R9 that you've probably been waiting on for most of this last season to finally show up into a track bike or full-fledged race bike for next season in 2026, do not hesitate to email us if you have any questions. You can get a hold of me directly at support at toolandarps.com. Even though I don't sell a lot of the hard parts directly that we use and go ahead and build these bikes, I'll happily point you in the right direction to go ahead and get you in touch with the people that do manufacture those parts. The vast majority of our engine internals are all provided by Chuck Giacchetto at Giac Moto Yamaha Racing, who is one of the factory back team owners here in Moto America. And a lot of the other components like the attack linkage, for example, or the attack rear sets or the woodcraft clip ons we ended up using, I can obviously go ahead and funnel you toward the correct avenues to go and purchase those parts as well. And last but not least, if you're simply looking to get your R9 properly tuned and dialed in for your specific intake and exhaust system, you've still got the stock engine in there, but you just want it to run properly for your specific setup, look no further than tooldynaworks.com. All of our mail and ECU flashing services for the Yamaha R9s are up there on our site for $349.99. Simply go ahead and follow the instructions on our site, ship us your ECU, and we'll get it flashed. It's shipped right back out to you the very same day that we receive it.